and uh, I'm part of I'm part of Mukherjee from Purdue. With me, we have uh, Professor Matt McDowell from Georgia Tech. He's going to host our session today. This is our uh, sort of the last session of this semester, a Frontier Series. It's a multi-university series, as you are all aware, and you can see here. Thanks to all of our uh, co-organizers from different universities. But most importantly, I'd like to thank a, a, a very big round of thanks to Ben Wright, who is right here, who is, has helped with all the organization, as you could see, orchestrating the entire thing. With that, uh, today our session is on sensing and metrology, and let me hand it over to Matt, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Partha. So I'm Matt McDowell. I'm a faculty member at Georgia Tech, and uh, I'm here to introduce our moderator today, uh, Professor Dave Mitlin. Um, we have a very Texas-centric group today, as <laughs> we mentioned earlier. Uh, professor <laughs> Mitlin is the Cockrell Endowed Professor uh, in the Walker Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And before that, he came from Clarkson University and also the University of Alberta earlier in his career. Uh, he's published very widely in the areas of energy storage materials, metallurgy, corrosion, uh, over 150 uh, uh, peer-reviewed articles. He's also the associate editor for the journal Sustainable Energy and Fuels. So we're very happy to have you, Dave, today uh, as the moderator. So please go ahead. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me on this uh, balmy, you know, 100, 125 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit uh, day in Central Texas. Um, so I am extremely happy to uh, host uh, or to moderate for uh, two colleagues uh, that are going to be speaking back to back. Um, first is Professor Tanya Hutter, who um, who's, we are we're in the same building. Uh, uh, Dr. Hutter is an assistant professor at the Walker Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research interests lie in the field of emerging molecular sensing technologies, nanomaterials, mi microfabrication, nanophotonics with applications in environmental industrial sensing, homeland security, and medical diagnostics, and actually battery materials too, because we're collaborating on some subjects there. Um, Dr. Hutter has a bachelor's in chemical engineering from Ben Gurion University master's in um, material science and engineering from Tel Aviv University and PhD from University of Cambridge. Uh, she, in addition to being a very productive researcher, she also uh, has two startups in the fields of chemical sensing. Uh, my second good colleague who I'd like to introduce uh, is uh, Dr. Xiaofeng Lan. Uh, Dr. Lan is an assistant professor in the mechanical engineering primary and material science and engineering affiliated Texas A&M University, so our arch rival, <laughs> working on fundamental study and application of light matter interactions at small micro, nano, molecular, atomic scale. Before joining a and he was a postdoc fellow at University of Berkeley, California, Berkeley, where I went to school, at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He received a PhD in electrical and computer engineering with a physics minor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. His doctoral thesis work is on engineering nanostructures for developing devices that simultaneously support optical and electrical functionalities. In recognition of his multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary accomplishments, he has received many prestigious awards, including uh, the Graduate Student Medal from MRS, DJ Laval Scholarship from SPIE, and Best PhD Thesis Award from Sigma Chi Honor Society. So I will be moderating this. Uh, my personal background. My personal background in sensors is actually quite limited. I worked in materials for sensors for some time before kind of migrating to, um, to battery materials and various energy storage applications. But uh, clearly, these two young early career academic researchers are way at the forefront of the sensing field much further than I ever gotten. So with that, I'll just turn it over to uh, Dr. Hutter first. All right, thank you so much, Dave, for the introduction. Let me just share my screen. All right. Okay, so can you hear me and see my slides okay? Excellent, okay. All right, so uh, my talk today is on mid-infrared uh, fiber sensors. And before I, I start, I would like to briefly just uh, 
mention what we do in, in my group. So we are focused on developing devices uh, and different uh, analytical techniques to detect various things, which can include um, biomolecules in, in tissues, in biological fluids, detecting explosives for homeland security, measuring things um, in the environment, such as airborne pollutants, pollutants in water, pollutants in soil, um, and I work a lot with, with industry uh, to help address the specific industrial needs in different areas. Um, and my research uh, focus is on uh, optical and electrochemical techniques mainly, and it ranges from the basic science and microfabrication and trying to understand the molecular interactions on the surfaces, all the way to building complete devices with functionality that can be tested in the field. And my talk today, uh, the short title is Need Infrared uh, Fiber Sensors. Uh, the longer title as Silver Halide Need Infrared Fiber Optics Probes for in situ monitoring of bioprocess and volatile organic compounds. So I will briefly start describing fiber probes and what optical sensors are. I'll talk about infrared spectroscopy. I'll discuss silver halide as a material for infrared uh, spectroscopy. And I will present two specific applications and sensor configurations that can be used uh, for sensing. So first of all, um, as you probably all know, in fiber optics, we have a core and a cladding and the light propagates inside the core and the refractive index of the core is slightly higher than the refractive index of the cladding. So optical fibers are not meant to be sensitive to the environment. Uh, however, to make sensors from them, we have to remove the cladding on the top and the light that propagates inside the core can interact with the environment via the uh, evanescent field that propagates in a close vicinity to the surface. And there are different types of waveguides. One can build embedded waveguides or waveguides that sit on top of a substrate or optical fibers that just don't have any cladding uh, on top of them. And this is a standard uh, configuration here of a cross section of a waveguide on a substrate and the analyte is here at the top. And the red curve here, this is the evanescent field, and it has some penetration depths, which will depend on the refractive index of the material, the refractive index of the analyte, and the wavelengths used uh, for, for the measurement. So normally such sensors um, don't have selectivity on their own. So if you just shine visible light, for example, in a waveguide, and here you put uh, a solution, let's say, of water and sugar, so the only thing you're actually measuring is the change of light at the detector at the other end, which is affected mainly by the refractive index of the solution. So it's very difficult to make very uh, selective sensors in this way. Therefore, a common strategy is to add functional uh, groups on top of a, of a waveguide or fiber. And those groups are responsible for highly selective um, attachment of the target molecules with the waveguide. So all the non-selective attachments hopefully will not be in the vicinity of the waveguide and therefore you're measuring specifically that. Um, and those waveguides mainly used for, for liquids. Um, however, we are trying to measure things in a gas phase. So in a gas, gas phase is very difficult to measure because in a gas phase, the, um, the density of the gas, especially at the very low concentration, such as required for indoor air quality or for explosive detections, we will have only a few molecules of, of the analyte uh, molecules in the gas phase. So evanescent field will not detect them because first of all, they could be far away from the surface and also their um, concentration on the surface will be very low. So this is why normally optical waveguides and optical fibers are not uh, widely used for gas sensing. And here we can see two commercial probes that one could purchase for infrared uh, sensing or not only infrared. So this is um, a small fiber curved in a U shape and it has no cladding. So if you insert that probe into some liquid, the light that propagates in the curved fiber will interact with the solution. And this is a, a diamond, small diamond reflection probe. So the light goes, uh, touches that diamond, reflects back into the probe and you have like kind of one bounce at the end. And those are the commercially available probes. And again, those are not used for, for, for gas phase and also that many times not small enough for many applications. 
Um, so therefore, one of my uh, projects is to develop beta fiber probes, make them more selective, make them more sensitive, and make them also smaller, um, and also explore their uses in different um, applications. So um, infrared spectroscopy is a very useful technique uh, for all chemists and not only chemists. So in this technique, uh, you would use infrared light and you shine it onto molecules over a certain optical path length. So this is the distance between uh, your, your chamber, if it's a gas or liquid. Uh, so it's the interaction path lengths of light with the molecules. And when in infrared light interacts with them, some the molecules at a certain frequency will vibrate and rotate um, creating absorbance in that wavelength. And the graph here shows for some common small gases, we can see ammonia, carbon dioxide. And as you can see, there are very specific peaks for each uh, molecule. And some of them actually overlap. So it's very important to understand which molecule you're measuring and in which background in order to choose the best wavelengths for the specific application. So for example, carbon dioxide here, this huge big absorbance, normally measured at 4.2 micrometers because other gases don't absorb in this wavelength. So if you're using this wavelength to measure, you have a specific to carbon dioxide. Um, and within the infrared spectrum, we have near infrared region, which is from 800 to 2.5 micrometers. And near infrared region um, is low cost region. So developing sensors in this region, um, it's easier because you have Silica fibers you can use. There are lots of uh, light sources and detectors uh, that are made for telecommunication wavelengths of 1.5 micrometers. So this spectroscopy is much cheaper and more industrially applicable. The problem with it that the peaks here are very uh, broad and very low intensity. So it's not as sensitive for many applications. Whereas the finger prick region that uses um, five to 15 micrometers roughly this is the region where most chemists will analyze the sample and will be able to provide the exact molecular information of the sample you're measuring. So the peaks here are much stronger, therefore you can detect lower concentrations and also they're much more narrower, which allows you to uh, detect many different types of species. So there's always a compromise between the near IR and mid IR. And again, different applications will require selection of a different uh, wavelengths. And if we're looking at the different materials for infrared spectroscopy, so here we can see in uh, x-axis of UV, visible and infrared wavelengths and the different materials. So for example, um, let's look at, I don't know, fused silica here. We can see it is transparent from roughly 300 nanometers to two micron. Um, however, you can see for mid-infrared, the selection of materials is also kind of limited um, and also materials it's very important to think about uh, chemical stability of those materials. Not all of them are suitable to work in the specific requirements, such as inside um, a biological tissue or inside a battery or inside the reactor um, due to the chemistry of those. So there's a limited choice of different infrared materials here that we can use. Um, and some of them are toxic and some of them are not very stable. Um, and one specific material that um, I worked with, with a collaborator from uh, Tel Aviv University, Abraham Katsir. So in his group, he's um, making uh, silver halide uh, different fibers. So silver halides, those are polycrystalline materials uh, with silver chloride and bromide. And they are transparent in a wide spectral range from three to 18 micron. They are non-toxic and they are biocompatible. Um, and the, so our collaborator made fibers for this project for us with a different core diameters, different lengths, and the losses were characterized by him as well. Um, and they're very low. So here, for example, we can see also the refractive index of uh, silver halides when the concentration of uh, chloride ranges between um, zero and one, uh, which means that we can also tune the refractive index of this material slightly uh, between roughly two and 2.2. .2. Uh, between those values. And the ways those fibers are made is by growing those crystals inside the chamber, inside the quartz tubes uh, with a heater around them. Um, and then they grow over the time, they solidify. And then to make the fibers, uh, the extruder is used. So you just push them out through a small uh, hole in here and uh, optical fiber kind of comes out. So this is an optical fiber of only the core. There's no cladding on top of it. 
Um, and here are some examples of the actual, uh, those quartz tubes with the material which has yellowish color. So we've used those fibers uh, for, for our work um, to develop some sensors for them. And first application where such sensor could be useful is for monitoring bioprocesses. Um, so one, uh, one kind of a company we worked with, uh, we're doing fermentation of, uh, of sophorolipids. And the challenge was for them is to measure glucose continuously, but also they wanted to also measure the product, the, sophoro, the lipid that they produce. The sophorolipid also has two different forms. Um, they have lactonic and acidic. And this is something it took them a few days to measure. So they had to take analysis of the reactor, go to analytic instrument and measure it offline. In addition, they need to know glucose concentration continuously in order to keep on adding to the reactor uh, glucose to ensure the production is rapid as they want to. So we took this completely offline method that was very time consuming. And we wanted to see whether we could develop uh, a fiber sensor that can sit inside the reactor and continuously monitor both glucose and the two types of the different uh, sophorolipid products. So although you can see chemically, the two products are very similar. There is one difference in one group here uh, that is different. And this is what we thought we could probably detect uh, with infrared spectroscopy. So we've measured the spectra of the glucose, sophorolipids and rapeseed oil, which is uh, a reagent used, uh, used in, the, in the reactor. And just by looking at the different spectra of uh, the absorbance, uh, as a function of wavelengths, we can see that there are some unique peaks that can be used indeed to uh, measure those different compounds. And our setup was uh, as shown here, we, we took a FTIR fiber, um, um, fiber coupled spectrometer. And here we have one uh, kind of uh, connector here, the light comes out from the fiber, it goes into the fiber loop and then goes back into the spectrometer. Uh, we took the reactor um, broth here, which is our solution, and we put it in on a hot plate if we needed to heat and to steer it uh, in order to make sure it's all fully mixed. So this is a, um, a photo of this homemade fiber with SMA connectors. Those are standard optical connectors to connect to the spectrometer. And this uh, faint yellow fiber loop, this is the exposed fiber. And the black tubes here act as a shielding for the optical light so as a cladding. And here are some photos of it without and with the, uh, with the solution. So first we measured it using standard ATR FTIR technique, which is a standard large uh, spectrometer, uh, standard FTIR instrumentation by putting a drop uh, on the spectrometer and measuring the spectrum. And we did this for different sophorolipid concentrations. Um, and we could plot uh, a quite linear graph uh, showing the peaks of the sophorolipid grow as the concentration is increases as expected. Then when we did that same thing with the fiber loop, um, as you can see, as we increase the concentration, there is some um, kind of, it's not linear the whole way. And so we see some saturation. It does not increase as it should. Um, and some of the things that that uh, indicates is that over time, um, the sophorolipids just stick to the fiber because with ATR, FTIR, we will clean the crystal in between. And here we actually put the fiber there and continuously measured. So there's some buildup uh, of the different components onto the fiber uh, end, which highlights the importance of uh, developing different types of coatings um, or maybe cleaning rapidly in between and more often between the sampling, which is obviously not great for continuous monitoring. So those are types of things that uh, we are working on, on solving uh, with our technologies. And another important uh, factor was for, for, in, for this project is, can we actually disti distinguish between lactonic and acidic sophorolipids? Um, and we can see here that um, for different concentrations, so here the, the blue curve uh, is 100% uh, lactonic, and the other one here, the red one is 100% uh, acidic. And we can see that there are unique peaks for each one of those. So by monitoring the ratio of the peaks, uh, we could easily find the, uh, the concentration of both lactonic and acidic sophorolipid concentration in, in the product in the reactor. So now I'll move on to a different example uh, where fiber optics uh, can be useful. And this is measurement of volatile organic compounds. So 
here we have a class of water organic compounds material, which there are hundreds of them in the environment. And VOCs are emitted from carpets, from uh, new materials, from plastics. Um, VOCs are used for medical diagnostic. For example, dogs can smell cancer. So if you exhale VOCs, you exhale thousands of VOCs in your breath, in your skin. We all have hundreds of those VOCs around us. So by measuring a certain composition or certain relative um, concentrations of the different compounds, we can diagnose disease, we can uh, detect different types of cancers, um, even Alzheimer's. Uh, so there are lots of studies looking at measuring VOCs. But VOCs are, first of all, very important for industrial monitoring. They're used in the production of lots of things. Um, and many of them are very toxic and bad for the environment. So uh, we tried uh, with fiber optics two approaches to measure uh, VOCs. So as I said initially, uh, ga gaseous compounds, especially at low concentrations, they don't just sit on top of a fiber. They're just in a gas. So was there a way for us to bring them closer to the fiber and make them effectively stick on top of the surface. So in one approach, uh, we coated the fiber with nanoporous particles. Um, and in the second approach, we added the porous membrane. So we, we first needed to fabricate the nanoporous uh, membrane and we used nanoporous silicon um, and we used electrochemical um, etching to, to produce nanopores. So in this process, we, we have a silicon wafer um, and then we put an O-ring and we put it inside the cell and we have a counter electrode of platinum here. We add hydrofluoric acid solution with some ethanol and then we apply a current. So we effectively force the current to flow uh, through the system. And what happens here is that normally uh, we use P-type silicon. So um, the etching, the whole, whole formation effectively begins at the impurities on the surface. Those are random impurities on the surface and that then starts etching. And then if we etch deeper, deeper, we can also control whether the pores go only down or they also go to the sides and branch and become interconnected. So this is a well-controlled process, which allows us to produce uh, nanoporous materials uh, with highly controlled porosity and thicknesses. So here's an example of a porous silicon layer on top of silicon. This is air at the top. If we zoom in on the pores, we can see those highly interconnected uh, pore network. And this is a top view showing quite small pores of roughly 10 to uh, 50 nanometers in size. Um, and we can also detach those films from the silicon surface. So by etching it at a certain time, at a certain depth, then we will apply a really high um, electric uh, current and it will just detach the whole uh, membrane. So this is a porous silicon uh, membrane here um, on the right hand side. So what we did now, we thought, okay, how we can use this uh, stiff effectively like glass and it's very fragile porous silicon membrane in order to coat our optical fiber. And the reason why we wanna use porous materials because they add, um, they increase uh, the capillary condensation of the volatile organic compounds. So those are effectively like sponges that will take on all the VOCs from the surface and keep them um, inside the pores. And if we can put those pores, those materials on top of the fiber, then the evanescent field of the fiber will interact with, with our gas molecules. So what we did here, we, we took our fiber and then we took the membranes and we put them in a sonicator, um, which effectively destroyed the membrane completely. And it created microparticles that have nanopores. So in a micro scale here, we can see um, those relatively large big particles coated on top of a fiber. And if you zoom in on one particle, you can see it has the nanoporous structure. And those nanopores will absorb uh, the VOCs from the environment. Um, so first thing we needed to make sure that um, our nanopores don't completely absorb all light that's passing through the fiber. So for an uncoated fiber, you can see here uh, intensity versus wavelengths uh, or wave number. Um, and it shows that we have these types of behavior, those peaks, and this is because the fiber absorbs something. This is also the light lamp that is used in the FTIR. It has a certain shape. Um, but as we adding more and more layers, we can see most of the spectrum, the absorbance changes only a bit. It absorbs a bit, 
but here we have a very strong absorbance. And what happens is, is that our porous silicon, while we went through all this process of uh, coating it and breaking it to small particles, it oxidized because silicon will spontaneously oxidize in air to form silica. So we can see here very uh, strong silica bonds. So effectively we are coating nanoporous silica particles on top of the fiber. So we also expose then uh, those uh, fiber probe after we coated it with different number of layers to acetone vapor. And we can see that acetone vapor peak, peak here, which is characteristic to acetone, increases as a function of number of layers. And if we plot the number of uh, layers as a function of the peak intensity, we can see that going from zero to one layer, it significantly increased our uh, intensity. However, if you add more and more, the effect uh, decreases. And there can be two reasons for this. One reason that the, mem that the um, particle thickness is already so thick uh, that the diffusion is more difficult, or it could be because as you add more and more, the evanescent uh, field is only one micrometer take close to the surface. So adding thicker layers gives no more benefit. So this shows the importance of optimizing also the thickness uh, of, for, for any optical coating for, for fibers. Um, then we, we also put a mixture of ethanol and acetone vapors, and we monitored each peak um, for different concentrations. And again, this can give us a very good way of measuring multiple analytes with this fiber probe, um, which is more difficult mostly with standard sensors where you rely on some specific chemistry and you are not able to measure multiple analytes. Uh, the next thing we wanted to check, okay, if they all absorb nicely, can they desorb rapidly as well? So what's the kinetics of the sensor? How fast, you know, the sensor can be, um, you know, can indicate the presence and also how uh, fast the sensor can regenerate to take a new measurement. So here we um, added, uh, started with air and that's the absorbance. We added acetone, the absorbance peak went up. We put back air and so on. So those are three injections of acetone and air. And you can see it is quite rapid response. Um, so the sensor is responding really fast. Um, and here we have a comparison of the coated fiber and uncoated fiber uh, as a function of acetone concentration. And we can see that we do improve um, the sensitivity uh, for this. Um, and then we did this uh, for three different VOCs, isopropyl alcohol, ethanol, and acetone. Um, the black uh, here, uh, black uh, bars is for the uncoated fiber, the red is for coated. So, and also we can see that the enhancement factor for the improved sensitivity for the different VOCs is different. And this is because different VOCs, first of all, have different size. Uh, they also will uh, undergo capillary condensation in the nanopores in different um, concentrations and different temperatures and different environments. So it is also very important to understand how the specific chemical will interact with the surface. So chemicals that are more polar, like ethanol uh, or acetone, are the ones we measure, they have polar oxygen group that will create strong Van der Waals interactions with the nanoporous silica. However, if we were to functionalize the nanoporous silica with hydrophobic coating, then we would expect uh, that this um, enhancement will be lower for polar groups and perhaps better for some others. And this is what will allow us to tune the coating to, for specific applications. And then another approach we looked at is, could we maybe do it in transmission mode, um, and, but this time introduce a porous silicon membrane in here in the middle, uh, and then the VOCs will uh, absorb into the pores and then we could measure it in a transmission mode. Um, and this is more compatible for flowing gases and you can integrate it in a nice flow cell where gas will flow this way and you would measure optically in the other way. So it can be a very small um, kind of uh, gas cell in this way. And we looked at the optical spectrum to see whether that's even possible. So we have a uh, spectrum, the green curve with no membrane where we add um, so we also fabricated two types of porous uh, silicon membrane, microporous and mesoporous. So microporous has pore sizes smaller than five nanometers and mesoporous is between uh, five and 50 nanometers. Um, so for those two different ones, we can see that uh, mesoporous has slightly better absorption in this region. 
so it doesn't absorb as much. We can also see very strong silicon age bonds. Uh, when the samples are freshly etched, we can see this bond, but over time, uh, silicon oxidizes and this will become uh, silica. Um, and then we, we actually forced our membranes to oxidize. So we put them in the oven uh, at 900 degrees for a few hours, and that transforms all the porous silicon to porous silica. And why we do that is that we know porous silica will be stable, will not change its properties. Whereas if we use porous silicon, over time it will keep on oxidizing um, in the air, which is not great uh, for a sensor to change its properties. Um, and again, we can see after oxidation, you can see a big uh, absorbance in this region and the SIH peak disappears. And the same thing we can see for also for meso and micro uh, silicon. So effectively the best regions will be here for the measurement, um, but also perhaps the other design configuration might be better for, for materials like silica that absorb a lot in the infrared. Um, so I will conclude now um, that uh, in this work, we used silver halide fibers uh, for infrared sensor probes. We could distinguish lactonic and acidic sophorolipids, uh, which are fermentation bioprocess products. We also shown that we can measure volatile organic compounds uh, with two different uh, approaches were presented. And our future work in this area is focused on miniaturizing those probes. Uh, and this is in, really important for bio, biomedical applications where you wanna insert the probe into the different tissues. And at the moment, the commercial probes are way too large for applications. And we're also working a lot on different types of nanomaterials and possible porous coatings that can improve the sensitivity and selectivity such as metal organic frameworks. And I would like to thank everyone who, who did this work. So this was a collaboration with the uh, University of Cambridge, Tel Aviv University, and Holy Firm, the fermentation company who provided the, the broth for, for the experiments. Um, and yes, thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Well, are, are we, I, I believe we're doing, are we doing questions Right after the presentations or after both presentations? After both presentations. After so both after presentations. So, so let's just stop. Okay, I will stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for the excellent talk. Uh, really. All right. Okay. So I share a slide? Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, do I need to share a slide now? Uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, Shafang Lan is uh, next and uh, you should be able to share your screen. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, uh, sorry, uh, the slides is sharing. Make sure. You well. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, howdy. Uh, this is the way. At Texas and then we say hello to everyone. And first, uh, let me thank David for the uh, introduction. And I also, I want to thank the committee for the invitation. I also want to thank Tanya for the fantastic talk previously. Uh, my research is also on optics, but from a different topic. Uh, we are focused on uh, optical chirality, which is the ubiquitous across the nano molecular atomic scales. And it's also the underlying mechanism for the asymmetric synthesis. And this talk is made possible by my current group at Texas a and my uh, previous group, postdoc group at Berkeley, a PhD group at Georgia Tech, as well as uh, many, many of the collaborators from all over the world and many funding agencies. First, the chirality was defined by the low Kevin in this 1904 Baltimore lecture, it says that structures that cannot superimpose on their, uh, on their mirror images are chiral. The most common objects, chiral objects are human hands because you see the left hand is a mirror image of a right hand, but they are not superimposable. That is why chiral materials are called left-handed, right-handed, or anatomous. Those anatomous, 
they, they are degenerated. They should have the same energy and they should have the same possibility to occur. If one zoom into our hands and look at the cells and molecules, they will find out that amino acid is also chiral. Mysteriously, there's only left-handed amino acid exists. This phenomenon is called the homochirality of life. The reason why homochirality happens is still under hot debate. But one thing we know is that it's a result of asymmetric synthesis to select one-handedness over the other during the chemical reactions. And this asymmetric synthesis is critical for the pharmaceutical industry. The reason is that more than 80% of the uh, small molecule drugs approved by the FDA are chiral. And the global market for the asymmetric synthesis is predicted to be more than $133 billion by 2030. There are two major uh, methods right now to do these things, asymmetric synthesis. They are using existing chiral objects to have the asymmetric synthesis. The examples are the 2001 and 2021 Nobel Prizes in chemistry. They are using chiral catalysis. It's like you, are, you, wanna, you, you don't know the handedness of the gloves, but you use your left hand to try on the gloves. If it fits on the left hand, it's left-handed. You see, all those methods, they are biological or chemical. The question we want to address over here is that whether we can physically induce asymmetric synthesis. And uh, um, according to Pierre Curie's symmetry principle, a result of the symmetry breaking, that is asymmetric synthesis, must have a physical force that also breaks the symmetry. And in 1956, Lee and Yang discovered that among all fundamental forces on the universe, they are electromagnetic force, a gravitational force, strong interaction, and weak interaction. Only the weak interaction will break the symmetry. The theory is very complicated, but I want to use an oversimplified model to analyze this symmetry breaking. The key is the pseudo-scalar. When I say pseudo-scalar, it's a in the product between an axial vector and a linear vector. In this case, the axial vector is the spin theta, while the linear vector is the momentum p. When a symmetry operator x operates on this pseudo scalar, it's no longer conserved. That's why almost all atoms are slightly left handed. However, this effect is extremely small on the order of thermal fluctuation. It's very hard to imagine that it will account for the homochirality of life. In 1997, Rick and from German discovered the new analogy in optics with orders of magnitude stronger. We can understand this effect by analyzing the dielectric constant epsilon in a common medium under a magnetic field. The Faraday effect will induce a Lama precession with an angular frequency omega L that is proportional to the magnetic field B. So the light will experience the dielectric constant that's not at the frequency of omega, but rather at the shifted frequency omega plus omega L. And similarly, in the chiral medium under a magnetic field, light will also experience a dielectric constant at the shifted frequency omega plus omega L, which leads to a uh, Newton that is proportional to the inner product between magnetic field and the wave vector. And this Newton, it's called the magnetochiral effect. Another characteristic of this magnetochiral effect is that it's proportional not to the, uh, directly to the chirality, but to the derivative of chirality, that is d alpha over d omega. So in this talk, we want to understand this magnetochiral effect for the goal that is to apply it to for the asymmetric synthesis. To that end, let's look at the chirality in the nature first. In the 19th century, Baptist Field and Pasteur discovered that the polarization of the light will rotate with an angle when light cuts through the titanic acid crystal. You might not know, you might not know what's a titanic acid crystal, but from this color, you can see 
that they are commonly seen in grape juice and uh, the red wine. And they attribute this phenomenon to the symmetry of the, um, of the ge geometry, and which also laid the foundation for sterile chemistry. And this chirality also appears in organic molecules in the, life, in the uh, living organisms. For example, the box over here, when you shine the uh, RCP or LCP or right circularly polarized light or left circularly polarized light, the colors are different. Measuring the optical chirality, however, it's not an easy task. Uh, generally, there are two optical responses from those chiral medium. One is the circular dichroism, the other is optical activity or optical rotation. For the circular dichroism, the absorption of the LCP and RCP light will be different, which corresponding to the imaginary part of the refractive index. But for the optical rotation, when you shine a light on the chiral medium, the, polarized, the linear polarization, polarization will rotate with an angle, which corresponding to the real part of a refractive index. So the circular dichroism and the optical rotation, they are related with the Kramer's chronic relation. And the best practice for optical chirality is to measure the difference of the LCP and RCP light in terms of a transmission, reflection, or emission. And to measure the optical activity for the natural chiral materials, it's around one milli degree. For the stronger chirality, one can artificially induce the chirality by structuring the optical medium. For example, in 1898, Bowles discovered that the polarization of the millimeter wave will rotate an angle when passing through the twisted jute elements. The jute is just a fiber from, from the plants. And recently, there emerges a, another structured optical medium, which is called metamaterials. Metamaterials append material properties from the structure and geometry rather than the chemical compounds. And similar to the natural atoms, metamaterial also have metal atoms. In natural materials, natural atoms is at the length scale of around one nanometer. While for the metal atoms, this length scale can be anything ranging from tens of nanometers to hundreds of micrometers or even longer. The good thing about this lens scale is that it's doable, fabricate, fabricable in a modern semiconductor fabrication foundry. For example, we fabricate the metal material that has a pitch of around one micrometer. The key to the um, metal material is that you have a structure that is smaller than the wavelength of interest. The reason is that Material prop properties are materials responses to the electromagnetic waves that have some specific wavelengths. So when you change the structures that are smaller than the wavelengths of interest, the electromagnetic wave cannot see the change, but rather they recognize the metal material as a new material. That's why by changing the structure, typically the size, you can change the materials to respond to any wavelengths of interest. For example, that is why you can see Acoustic metal materials, terahertz metal materials, and optical metal materials. And with those metal materials, people can have some very exotic properties not found in nature, for example, negative reflective index, or an uh, invisibility cloak, the Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. I want to show you an example, an example over here that is shown on, in the figure on the right. There's an invisibility cloak made of a metal material inside a tank of water, you can see the grass after the cloak, but you don't see a fish inside this cloak. And that's a real fish. Let me show you the video. Uh, see, the, the hole is small. You know, there's a fish tail outside that. And, uh, um, I think the, the hole is very much smaller, the head of the fish. So they're trying to get out of that cloak, the hole. All right. Um, oh, they are trying to force that fish to get out of this cloak. The, the hole is relatively small. Oh, see, now uh, 
the um, fish is out. You see, this is the one of the examples for the cloak. Um, but in this talk, we are not going to make this cloak again, but rather we want to use this metamaterial to have another exotic property, which is the giant optical chirality. That these two, the two topics I'm going to give you for today. The first one is we want to introduce the uh, chiral metamaterial by twisting nanostructures. We can achieve the chirality that is um, all the stronger than that in natural materials. And we also observe that this chirality can be tuned ranging from infrared to visible, visible wavelengths range easily. And we further push the chirality to a smaller scale, that is atomic scale, by twisting 2D materials. And we use this chirality from the 2D materials to couple to the ferromagnetism, leading to the magnetochiral effect we mentioned at the beginning, which is promising for asymmetric synthesis. And indeed, in the past two decades, there are many groups around the world have obtained giant chirality from the chiral metamaterials using various structures. The key to chirality is the symmetry breaking along the wave propagation direction. The most uh, uh, prominent example is the helix over here. You see, the rotating manner along the all, all of plant aspects will break the symmetry. And this is, you can see, it's a, a 3D structure with several pitches at the uh, sub wavelength scale. And we found that rather than several pitches, half of pitch is already good enough. We further separate the half pitch into two arcs with an angle beta. And we place those two arcs into two layers. This action dramatically reduced the fabrication burden because now we can fabricate it layer by layer. While this action will not sacrifice the chirality, you can see the figure on the right shows the transmission difference of LCP and RCP light in the infrared wavelength range from 1.1 1, 1 .1 micron to 1.6 micron. The chirality is huge. For example, at the wavelength of 1.4 micron, you can see the transmission difference will be around 0.3. Around 0.3, which corresponding to an optical rotation of around 30 degrees. For comparison, I want to remind you that the optical rotation for the natural chiral material is around one milli degree. So our chirality is more than four orders larger than that in natural materials. Not to mention that the thinness of our chiral material is less than 200 nanometers. Another characteristic of the chiral material is that we can tune the resonant wavelengths. We find out that the pitch R, um, the, the radius R, as well as the distance between the two arcs D, will generally determine the resonant wavelengths. The thinness of the arcs T, the wicks W, will fine tune the spectrum, while the uh, angular span of the alpha will determine the spectral span of the uh, LCP and RCP spectrons while the angular separation beta will determine the spectral separation of LC and LCP and RCP responses. So if you want to design a resonant wavelength that's shorter from the infrared to visible, we can simply use the following geometry by manage shrinking the first three geometries. Indeed, we observe the giant chirality in the visible range. For example, at the wavelengths of around uh, 600 nanometers, we observe the transmission difference between RCP, that is the, the um, red curve, and the LCP, that is the blue curve. The difference is around, uh, it's a positive 0.3 over here. This is because it's in the anatomy A. And on the other hand, if we use the anatomy B, which is the mirror image of anatomy, B, uh, anatomy A, the spectral behavior will flip. For example, again, at the wavelengths of around 600 nanometers, the transmission difference between RCP, that is red curve, and uh, the LCP blue curve, it's minus 0.3. And more, more interestingly, this chirality from those nanostructures can be 
coupled to nearby objects, such as the quantum dots and 2D materials. For the quantum dots, we observed the circular polarized, polarized uh, emission, otherwise will not be possible. And for the 2D materials, in this case, it's a graphene, we can separate, analyze, and detect the full stock's polarization of light on a monolithic device. Let's pause for a second and ask ourselves, can we push the chirality further to a smaller scale, for example, atomic scale? The answer is yes. The King and the colleagues, instead of twisting nanostructures, they twisted the 2D materials, in this is a graphene. They observed the optical rotation of around 6.5 milli-degree. Considering, considering that the graphene is only atomically thin, this optical rotation it actually is gigantic. And they suggest that this optical rotation can be further enhanced by using semiconducting 2D materials with acetones. That is why we use the WS2 or tungsten disulfide, because, because WS2 is a semiconducting 2D material, which also has the acetone. And to couple to the magnetism, we also place the twisted layers on top of a ferromagnetic substrate. In this, in this case, the ferromagnetic substrate is the thelium iron garnet or TIC. The TIC has the current temperature that's around 400 Kelvin, which is above the room temperature. So we can have this operate this device at the room temperature. And also the uh, ferromagnetism of the TIC is relatively soft. So we can easily switch the, uh, the direction of the magnetic moment from the uh, ferromagnetic substrate. A fabricated device is shown on the right. You can see the twisted angle, in this case, is positive 26 degree. It's because the, the top layer is twisted uh, clockwise towards the uh, bottom layer. And we use the edges to determine the uh, twisted angle. We know that the, the edges tend to align well with the crystalline axis during the exfoliation. Although this method is not as accurate as the optical methods, for example, second harmonic generation, in this case, it's much more than enough. The reason is that the twisted angle is large, it's 30 degrees. And as a typical transition metal dichalcogenide or TMDs, WS2 has two degenerate values in its band structure. For the chirality, it will induce the population difference in the two values, K plus and K minus, for the magnetic optical effect, it will induce the shift of the band structure and also lift the degeneracy between those two values. For the magnetochiral effect, it's a combination of the two, but later I will show you it's not a simple superposition. First, let's study the chirality by placing the twisted WS2 layers on a silicon substrate, which is non magnetic. In the WS2 layers, there are two values, K plus and K minus. When we shine a light with the photon energy of EPH, the uh, population of the two values will be different. The reason is that the twisting will induce a chirality, which has the circular dichroism. So they will absorb different amount of the LCP and RCP pumping light. Therefore, they will excite different number of acetones in the two valleys. As a result, the emission of the two valleys from that is theta plus and theta minus will be different as well. And during the, during the experiment, we observed that theta minus, the blue curve is larger than the theta plus. The reason is that a twisty angle in this case is minus 20 degree or counterclockwise. For comparison, we also measure the theta minus theta plus from a monolayer WS2 on a silicon substrate. We know that monolayer WS2 does not have the twisty induced chirality. So we observe that theta minus and theta plus, they are the same. Evident by using the overlapping trash, uh, dashed uh, curves over here. And this control experiment verified that we observed the acetonic chirality in the twisted bilayers. And it also shows that we have correct all the errors during the measurements to that can induce the circular polarization. And second, let's look at the magnetic optical effect by placing a monolayer WS2 on top of a, a ferromagnetic substrate as a tick. 
the tick can provide a magnetic moment. So the first the magnetic moment will interact with the spin, which leads to the interband transition delta ES. So the delta ES has the same magnitude, but a different shifting, shifting direction for the two values. And because of spin orbit coupling, they were also induced an interband transition. This time, many focus on the uh, um, valence band, valence band. So the shifted band structure will have a different energy levels as well. When we shine a light that has the same energy, the population of the two values will also be slightly different due to the Fermi distribution. But during the experiment, indeed, we observed spectron shift of around 0.5 nanometers between the PL emissions, the theta minus and theta plus. And this 0.5 nanometers corresponding to a magnetic field of around seven Tesla. And this is at the temperature of 78 Kelvin. And we know from the Bloch theory about the ferromagnetism, uh, the dependence on the temperature, the ferromagnetic magnetic field of around seven Tesla will further reduce to 2.7 Tesla at the room temperature, which corresponds to a 0.2 nanometers. It's very hard to measure such a small difference in the PL spectrum during the, uh, at room temperature. Not to mention that there's a significant thermal broadening at room temperature. And luckily, we can measure the rotation of the polarization using a reflection setup, which is similar to the magneto optic curl effect or MOC setup that typically used for studying the magnetic materials. In the reflection spectrum, we can see a dramatic peak at the wavelengths of around 615 nanometer, that is the acetonic wavelengths. Now let's focus on these wavelengths and look at the uh, rotation of the polarization. And the figure on the right shows the rotation of the polarization. The intensity minimum represents the polarization angle or rotation of the angle. For the reference sample, that is a uh, monolayer WS2 on the second substrate, we see nothing because the minimum is at zero degree. But when we place this monolayer WS2 on the ferromagnetic substrate, for example, the, the red curve, the minimum or the polarization rotation will not be zero again, but rather in this case, it's around two degrees. We further verify this phenomenon by switch the magnetic field from the, the up to the, uh, to the down. In this case, the spectrum, the rotation angle also flips then to, for example, the blue curve, the polarizing rotation angle is around minus two degrees. So we observe the both the clarity and magnetic optical effect. And here comes our major results. At the beginning, we mentioned that the magnetic chiral effect is proportional to the inner product between the magnetic field B and the wave vector K, also as well as the derivative of the chirality D alpha over D omega. For the chirality, we obtain the natural circular anisotropy or NCA by subtracting the LCP and RCP components of the emission. We can see a gigantic peak at the wavelengths of 615 nanometers, which means that this chirality is strongly enhanced by the acetonic effect. And the spectrum width is around seven nanometers. And we know that the derivative of a single peak spectrum will be a peak and a, in a dip uh, and a dip. Indeed, in the magneto chiral spectrum, we observe the peak and a dip. And the distance between the peak and the dip is seven nanometers, precisely the spectrum weeks of the chirality. This verifies that this magneto chiral effect is proportional to the derivative of the chirality. And when we change the relative direction between the magnetic field and wave vector, the spectrum behavior also flips. For example, at the wavelengths of around 7, 12 nanometers or 6, 12 nanometers, the, the dip of the red curve changes to a peak in a blue curve. With those perspectives, we are confident that we observe the magnetic chiral effect. More details can be found in a, a paper published in Nature Communications recently. So now let's go back to our original question. Can a magneto chiral effect really induce asymmetric synthesis? And recently, there's an Israel group discovered that um, the chiral materials have an asymmetric absorption on the ferromagnetic substrate. In this case, 
the kind of material is called polyalanine or PAL. When the um, magnetic field is up or H plus, the more left-handed molecule or L molecule will be adopted on the surface. While the magnetic field is down or H minus, more right-handed or E molecules will be adopted on the surface. There's no such an uh, asymmetric absorption on a gold surface because gold is non magnetic. They attribute this phenomenon to the interaction between the spin from the ferromagnetic substrate and the spin current from the chiral molecule, which is, is exactly a spin or electronic version of the pseudo scalar. That's why we, we think it's promising that our magnetochiral effect will also induce such a phenomenon. To summarize, we have obtained a giant chirality by twisting nanostructures as well as the 2D materials. And those chirality can be coupled to nearby objects such as quantum dots and 2D materials. They also can be coupled to the ferromagnetism, which leads to the magnetochiral effect that is promising for asymmetric synthesis. With that, I am happy to take questions. And then also you can send me email or have some comments on my website. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for uh, two excellent presentations. I really enjoyed them and I'm sure the audience did too. So now we have questions uh, raised by the audience that people could either just ask directly or text. Uh, David, do I need to stop share and ask the panel to Answer the question first, or? Yeah, um, you, could, you could stop sharing for now. Okay. And then you can yeah, take Thank you. So any questions uh, from the audience? You could uh, text. Uh -huh. I have a question. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I have a question to Dr. Tanya. Uh, in case of solgel induced electroisthon nanoporous silicon, this usually gets agglomerated into fibrous surface and its currents get uniform layered everywhere, both in cases of coated and uncoated. How did you solve this issue? And could you please uh, comment regarding the electrochemical performance of nanoporous silicons, where uh, how much volume expansion is getting reduced in case of uh, nanoporous silicon? Thanks. Thanks, yeah. So um, your first question was about um, Sorry, what exactly? Uh, in case of coated and uncoated, uh, yes. solder induced electrospin nanoporous silicons, usually it gets agglomerated and not uniformly layered everywhere. Yes. So how did you solve yeah. this issue? Yeah, so unfortunately, when you're using microparticles, which are uh, nanoporous in our case, but it's hard to layer them nicely on top of an optical fiber. Um, so our approach to solve this would be possibly embed those microparticles with a polymer and create like this type of coating. Um, but if you're just depositing those on their own, it's very difficult to control their, layer, their layering and their thickness. Um, and another thing would perhaps be just using uh, other materials such as porous polymers or metal organic frameworks that will allow you perhaps better control because it's very hard to put it on curved fiber surfaces. If we were to use um, a, a waveguide, which is a planar waveguide, then it's easier to coat such stiff materials with a more um, controlled thickness on the top. However, again, the adhesion between the layer and the, fiber, and the fiber or the waveguide has to be really, really tight because of an essence field only a few micrometers on the surface. So if you have an air gap, you effectively missed an opportunity. So again, how to stick them to the surface, it's challenging because if you add the glue or anything like that, it will absorb the infrared light. So it is a challenge that we're still working on solving and the solution to it depends specifically on application because then we're looking, okay, which environment is gonna sit? What's the sensitivity you need? So I think the, my answer is uh, you know, very general. It very much depends because if you're looking at, um, you know, for an analyte at certain wavelengths, you can then, you don't care about the other ones. It's okay to choose materials that maybe will absorb at that wavelength so you can use them. Um, so that's what the homogeneity So We did not solve it in the case of our optical fiber. We just decided to take it in a different direction. And then your second question was something about the expansion of the silica or what did you mean? 
Yes, uh, in the second question, could you please comment regarding the uh, volume expansions of nanoporous silicons in as a electrochemical performance? So we did not look at volume expansion uh, because we don't work in, uh, you mean volume expansion due to oxidation? Yes. Yes, yes. So yeah, definitely. Uh, in other studies, we did look at that because when we etch porous silicon and we oxidize it, obviously it adds more oxygen atoms in there and our pores become smaller. Um, and some pores, if they are very small, they get blocked. Uh, and we, we did the nitrogen isotherm analysis. We did lots of other studies to see and normally decrease the pore sizes by, again, depending on the structure, by five nanometers or 10 nanometers. So we do see that the volume expansion uh, happens and it makes our pores smaller. Um, but again, it depends. Some people actually, you know, if you make really, really tiny pores and you do that, obviously you completely block the pores. Um, so this volume expansion is something we look at and we study and we know uh, how to control it if we need to. And then we're also doing all the other analytical techniques uh, to make sure it still remains porous after our um, uh, oxidation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, please go ahead, uh, Dr. Chang. Uh, hi, I want to thank both speakers for the excellent talk. Uh, I have a question for both, but maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Hutter. Uh, this is kind of related to a lot of the previous questions, and uh, I think we had kind of two approaches to FTIR and the kind of transmission mode. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your thoughts on the kind of the sensitivity limitations? And I think some of your data might already show some of this, right? I think uh, in your first experiment, you see kind of the saturation of the, the intense absorption due to uh, different concentration, but I think the slope is quite different from the, between those two, right? Can you comment a bit on that? Yes, yeah. So the slope will behave because we're using nanoporous materials to absorb the gases. It means there's nonlinear behavior, at least in a broad kind of in a full range. So if you're looking between zero and 100%, the same chemical, it will not be linear because the absorption, desorption, all the processes will not be very linear. Uh, and also we can see sometimes hysteresis. So when it goes in, it comes out in a different, you know, pressure or temperature. Um, and therefore, we need to design those materials to be suitable for an application. However, for practical applications, you don't want to measure high concentrations because at that point you can smell the toxic vapors. You already know it's there and nobody wants that. So we're really looking at measuring at parts per billion, parts per million concentrations. And this is where optical infrared spectroscopy would be fantastic for it, but it's not sensitive enough. And then people have to design those huge optical um, kind of cells that light will bounce many times. So they're big and bulky. And this is the main thing with infrared spectroscopy is trying to improve the sensitivity. So with different variations of techniques, we could detect down to parts per million range. But again, it very much depends on the interaction of the analyte with the surface we make. So if it's very, you know, if it's very strong interaction, we can accumulate a lot of it inside the nanopores, which means that the detection limit is very low. However, then it's more difficult to get rid of it because it doesn't want to come out that easily. So the sensor becomes slightly slower in response time. So we're looking at really optimizing this response times and the detection limit for each specific application. But we yeah, do get it, to PPM, yeah. Yeah, I think that limitation is not really, uh, you know, a physical limitation of the sensing process, but the design of the porosity, right? So when you have saturation or diffusion limited during processes or, or something. Um, yes. Yeah, and also that, and we're now starting to look at metal organic frameworks that have like pore sizes in the Anstrom range, whereas some of those porous silica, they're like 10 nanometers. So for a molecule, it's a huge pore. Whereas for when we're starting to look at really tiny pores, everything will be very, very different. And we can see some of those interactions very strong. And that's why some sensors might be just single use sensors where you just measure it one time and you cannot reuse it because the material will not release it back to the environment. So it's not a reusable sensor in that case. Okay, thank you. And I have a question for uh, Dr. Lan. Uh, uh, I think the, the chiral um, plasmatic uh, metamaterial is, is very interesting. The, I think the, uh, the first, I guess, the, towards the middle of, of your talk, you had these two arcs that were uh, kind of angularly separated. And you mentioned those were kind of fabricated using two layers of, uh, you know, kind of their lat, um, um, actually they're separated. So how sensitive is the optical properties uh, relate to uh, kind of the angular alignment of those two and, and also kind of the translation of the two? I guess I'm asking more about what are some of the challenges in terms of the fabrication of those structures? Do you have uh, uh, any issues with yield or 
how precise those have to be aligned? Uh, yeah, this is a really great question, actually, in terms of a fabrication. Um, previously, we mentioned that it's very challenging to fabricate three-dimensional devices. But right now, we are separating into two layers. We can fabricate in layer by layer. But you know that it's not like floating in the air. We need to have uh, um, other dielectric materials that emerge those small, small arcs into one layer, right? First of all, that's that part. The second question is that whether the angular stiff difference will affect the results. And from our analysis, that's, uh, we analyzed different parameters previously in order to de design a spectrum response from infrared to the visible wavelengths. We give a table on that, on that slides. We analyze that the angular span or angular difference beta, that is the angular difference between those two layers was slightly re um, um, reflect on the spectrum distance in LCB and RCB responses. It's not very sensitive. It's sensitive, but not very sensitive. The, the good thing about that part is that the spectrum is relatively broad. So you can still observe giant chirality, which means that the difference at some specific wavelengths, for example, we can observe that at 1.4 micron, the difference can be uh, 0.3. And during the fabrication, we didn't see a lot of issues. But rather, also during the fabrication, we used aligned even lithography. It's very sensitive, but not that sensitive to. Yeah, I think the, because I think the, if you look at each individual layer, you know, the, the angle tolerance is, uh, uh, is not as challenging as the kind of the alignment tolerance between the two, right? So have you looked at the sensitivity of, uh, let's say you get angle correctly, but you're offset by you know a few nanometers or something. How does that affect your 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 properties? I think that's kind of the probably the bigger challenge. Um, the, to answer that question, it is it will affect the results. But the, again, the key to induce the chirality is to have a symmetry breaking along the wave propagation direction. You can have a slightly overlap of those arcs, but still uh, it's symmetry broken. In that case, still it will induce some chirality, but whether that chirality is strong enough, that's another question. It will have some effects on that chirality. Yes. And I have a similar question. This might be kind of silly. So you have, on the uh, second half, you have the 2D materials, right? You have uh, some uh, angle that you're looking at. Does the absolute uh, offset between th those two matter? Like if you is line it, uh, I don't know what the lattice constant of the 2D material is, but you know, they're all of angstrom. But let's say, you're shifting a uh, misalignment of those two with you know, a fraction of, a, of an angstrom. Does that matter or change well, your property? This is a fantastic question. Very insightful, actually. Um, because the, you, when you look at the, the structure, it's atomic structure, right? It's hexagonal. So each, each lattice, it's around like a, a one nanometer, less than one nanometer, that, that lattice. So the shifting will reduce, will induce some effect, but not that significant, especially when you say, the twisting angle is around 30 degree. 30 degree is a huge angle compared to some small angles. There's some very emerging field which call Mori or the twisted bilayer graphene recently published in Nature that is will induce the superconductors. Those twisting angles like 0.5 degree or 1.1 degree, those are extremely sensitive. So that shifting is significant, but for us, it's not that significant. It's a great Thank question. Thank you. Thank you uh, for great discussions happening. Any other uh, questions or comments from the audience? If not, I have one small question uh, for uh, Tanya, uh, especially in the context of VOC, you know, that uh, tends to be uh, quite interesting, could be, uh, especially in the context of uh, uh, referring to battery energy storage, especially when it undergoes uh, thermal runaway or abuse scenarios, and certainly it, it, it has a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sort of toxic volatile ejecta, and certainly that is one aspect. But most importantly, even uh, uh, you know your thoughts in that context would be very important. Uh, but the second thing is that even for even for detecting such uh, sort of an external sort of a intrinsic temperature extrema that can happen in operation. Uh, using your optical technique, could we really detect such, uh, you know, and, and its time scale when we could have detected? Could you comment on this? Maybe a little bit, a little bit more on the macro scale <laughs> question, but uh, I, I believe that's uh, a little bit of relevance. I'm, you know, looking forward uh, to your thoughts on it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. So 
um, you know, you're referring to batteries, right? And specifically to, you know, um, this is something I'm starting to look into definitely. You know, we, we use those sensors for tissues, for biofluids. And, you know, now next thing is, you know, can we stick it inside the battery? The advantage is that the fibers are electrically inert. So we can actually, you know, it, it will not interfere. And then we can also, not only infrared, so infrared is just one example of my work, but I'm also doing near infrared and Raman. So you can use other techniques uh, and embed those fibers inside batteries. And obviously if we're not using any chemical coatings and anything like that, it can withstand temperatures. We can also use for Raman, for example, we can use, or for near infrared, we can use uh, polymer fibers, not just silica. So that opens up kind of more opportunities to design the, to use the right material for the application of the battery to make sure it can withstand, you know, the chemistry, the mm -hmm. you know the reactivity and the temperatures it might um, it might kind of you know be exposed to, and also we have opportunity to actually embed it in certain layers, perhaps in the battery that you can you know monitor in multiple places, and also with obviously with fiber sensors you could measure temperature as well, and you can measure pressure, and you can measure other things. So it's not just chemicals; it's more like the environment itself. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's a very exciting area, and you know definitely looking for now projects and collaborations if you. You know, if you're interested, happy to discuss oh, uh, for batteries. You know, that, <laughs> that, so that fits in very well. Recently, in a couple of papers, I've been, to, you know, if you see that FBG, the fiber uh, black grating, those kind of sensors that people are trying, yeah. probably one or two such uh, sort of a, a demonstration type or sort of initial feasibility type papers have come out. I am very much interested in discussing it for sure. Absolutely. I'm glad that we. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, um, Matt, do you have any comments here? Uh, otherwise, I'll ask a silly question to uh, Sao Feng, Dr. Lan. <laughs> Especially, it's amazing to see this asymmetry and such beautiful concept of chirality and asymmetry that you mentioned. And the last part you mentioned about the dimensionality. If you go into the nanoscale dimensions, you know, things suddenly, you know, have this own uh, kind of a new mechanisms or uh, that can come into play. Could you comment on that length scale of the nanoscale and to what extent, what are the limit, limiting uh, scale and what are the mechanisms that, uh, that are most important there when you go into that dimension? Maybe it's a very generic question, but I was very, I'm kind of excited to ask this anyway. <laughs> You know, it, this is a very, very interesting and very good question for, for that part, because eventually when you ring the devices from nanostructures to atomic scales, I mean, every single atom matters. And that is why if you look at the magnetochiral anisotropy for our results, it's around 4%. Still, it's not great because if you go to 100%, that is good for application. If 4% still not enough, the reason is that although we have the enhancement from acetonic effects, but still the line matter interaction optical pass is very, very small. It's out of plane direction, right? It's one atom. Mm -hmm. So there's another effect we can use, whether we can use the light on the surface, for example, surface plasmas, that will enhance, geometry enhance the effect. That is also we are working on for that part. And talking about the lens, the other lens we are need to consider is that we are using the ferromagnetic substrate which, is, which has the proximity effect, which means the magnetic or exchange interaction of the magnetic moment will have a distance, right? And right now, the ferromagnetic substrate, the tick we are using, it have, has the auto plan magnetic field. Auto plan magnetic field, the interaction lens can be less than five nanometers. So you cannot observe such an effect, although it's huge, the, the, Magnetic field can be huge at like 2.7 Tesla because 2.7 Tesla at room temperature, if you want to use a external magnetic field, that's a, that's a gigantic magnetic field, mm -hmm. right? So in that case, you also need to carefully choose the ferromagnetic substrate while you're keeping the current temperature at high temperature. So there's some other ferromagnetic materials where it has the implant magnetic field that's also can be used for the surface plasma because the waves are propagating on the surface, then implant will help. So all those will affect the results. That is why, although our results 4% is state of the art because in the nature paper published in 1997, the magnetic anisotropic, magnetic current anisotropic is around 0.1%. That is, that is when they discovered that part. We have 4%, but still it's not strong enough. We want to put, we, we want to pursue in a direction that's go to 100% if that's possible. 
for the practical applications that eventually will lead to asymmetric synthesis. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Matt, over to you, if you have any concluding or Yeah, I do have one uh, general question for both of you. And uh, it may it may not be uh, uh, very easily answered, I'm not sure. But, but both of you showed different aspects of material processing or fabrication, um, whether it's the fiber processing uh, or the, the lithography for the optical devices. So I'm wondering if there is, you know, thinking about if there could be one uh, significant advance in processing technique that would really enable you to do some interesting uh, uh, stuff with your materials, what would that be? Maybe a little bit outside the box. <laughs> I, I can go first. So I think for waveguides normally to make waveguides, we use lithography, we use masks, we use, you know, microfabrication process. So maybe even like using like a 3D printer for optical waveguides, I think mm -hmm. that could be really cool. Questions: How do you develop such materials that can undergo this? And uh, but you know, this is something definitely is very exciting. Is could we on demand draw different waveguide structures and different geometries without undergoing the, the full clean room process every time? Yeah, I guess you'd have to have really high quality interfaces between deposited material and things like this, right? Those are one of the challenges: is that optical roughness, you know, for optical waveguide propagation, the roughness is really important. So in the past, I tried like laser ablation and different other ways where you can just write the structures uh, or write around the structures, like a blade around them to make them. And it creates really huge roughnesses. But if we can, you know, melt the material a bit and allow the surface tension to create those smooth surfaces, I think that could be a very interesting thing to try. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Michelle Feng? All right. I think... Uh... This is very important because everybody knows that when we talk about optics, everybody knows that light matter interaction because photons they are not interacting. So materials definitely is a key player in this in these areas, right? For our structure, for our structure, the feature size is around 100, mic 100 nanometers. We generally use the electron beam lithography, which using the optical lithography, it's hard to achieve. Optical lithography is generally has the feature size of around one micrometer. And so we, in order to use that even in our graphic, it's very expensive. There's some alternative methods. I mean, 3D printing, it's very hard to achieve that resolution as well to uh, go to the 100 nanometers, but there are some, some possible methods right now. They can go to 100 nanometers for 3D printing. Another will be, another effect will be using the EUV, extreme UV lithography that can also go to the nano, uh, 100 nanometer scale or like several, the tens of nanometers, tens of nanometers that scale. And ultimately, we, we can use a nano imprint. Nano imprint method is another method because you can make those molds into uh, 100 nanometers or 20 nanometers. But after you get the mold, you can imprint, you can print that to any devices that can also go to larger scales. Okay, great. Thank you. I believe we could uh, conclude our session here today, right? It's uh, almost uh, close to for the, our uh, mark, uh, five o'clock Eastern time, almost there. Uh, so from all of us, uh, the organizing committee, and on behalf of uh, uh, <clears throat> Matt and I were organizing and seat, so we're just kind of uh, very grateful to you for your time and awesome, just awesome uh, presentations and discussions uh, today. And have a great weekend and have a great rest of the semester. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.